Ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome to today's lecture at the Institute of International and European Affairs by Professor Carmen Reinhardt, who holds the Sambanakis Professorship of the International Financial System at Harvard's Kennedy School. Professor Reinhardt will be speaking to us on the subject of debt in developing nations. This is, uh, uh, it's great delight and honor for the Institute to have Professor, Car Professor Reinhardt address the Institute today. Uh, her lecture is part of um, the Development of Matters series, uh, which is supported by Irish Aid. That's the Irish government's program of uh, international development cooperation. This has in fact been quite an important week for the uh, Development Matters series. Uh, we began by having Colin Brophy, the Minister for uh, Development and the, and the Diaspora, uh, speak to us about uh, food security issues and the Horn of Africa. A couple of days later, he was followed by Hannah Tete, who is the UN Secretary General's uh, Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa. Uh, and now, uh, completing a very busy week, we have Professor Reinhardt. Um, Carmen, you're very, very welcome. Uh, let me uh, begin by um, uh, summarizing your career to date. Um, and then I'll mention a few housekeeping points for, um, for the audience. Uh, Professor Carmen Meinhardt um, holds the chair at Harvard, which, which I mentioned. She's also a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, from 2020 to 2022, she was senior vice president and chief economist at the World Bank Group. She uh, has written a best-selling book with Kenneth Rogoff, uh, entitled This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly, a very uh, um, uh, challenging title, which notes the striking similarities between recurring uh, boom and bust episodes throughout financial history. Uh, she is an elected member of the Group of 30, and Forbes magazine identified her as one of 50 women who are shaping the future of global finance. So I look forward uh, very much to what she will be uh, uh, telling us today and to, to the Q&A session, which will uh, come after. As I say, it's part of uh, a development series with Irish Aid, which uh, the Institute hugely appreciates. And uh, it is, uh, it, it, it's a, I mean, the topic which Professor Reinhardt will be addressing is one of enormous importance, uh, in, particularly in the wake of the successive shocks that low income countries have experienced over the last few years and the implications for debt distress and, and solutions. Um, uh, so I, 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 on housekeeping points, Professor Reinhardt will speak for an initial 20 minutes or so and then we will have a Q&A session. Uh, audience members are invited to contribute questions and views uh, uh, as they occur to them. Please use the, the, um, uh, the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your screens. Uh, and uh, in addition, you are encouraged to tweet on the event using the handle uh, at IIEA. We're also live streaming the discussion, so a very warm welcome to all those who are joining uh, via YouTube. So with that, um, I have great pleasure in inviting Professor Carmen Reinhardt to take the floor. Carmen, over to you. Thank you, David. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I, I do think indeed uh, the topic of debt uh in developing countries particularly low-income countries is of great urgency of course the problems of debt do not end uh with the low-income countries there are, you know it it definitely is post covid uh uh post uh uh a global financial crisis for the past 15 years it's it's also been accumulating issue for also middle income countries and high income countries in varying degrees uh so without further ado let me uh ask for the powerpoint uh slides to be put up uh my theme today 
uh, is very much connected as, as noted on the issue of debt, but it's broader than that. Uh, and and I, I've called this the reversal problem. I presented the issue uh, uh, at a presentation uh, at the bank very uh, about a year into the pandemic uh, and and have highlighted that, this so-called reversal problem is a setback uh, for many developing countries in many dimensions. Uh, per capita incomes are lower, inflation is higher. Um, not only debt levels are higher, debt servicing costs are also higher, fiscal conditions have deteriorated, poverty, uh, the, the, the income inequality, there's, it, it, it is encompassing, is, is the point I am making. So that will be my theme today. Uh, if I could ask for the next slide. Um, so as I noted, I am going to cover, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to do it sketchily because I, I want to lay out the topic, but, you know, pro make sure that we have plenty of time uh, for discussion. Here's basically a menu uh, of the, the, the highlights, if you will, of, of some of the developments in this this setback uh which is really starting to resemble and in, in especially in in sub-saharan africa but not exclusively uh the the ambience the 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 the, the uh environment that we saw uh during the debt crisis of the 1980s um, and I will speak to that next. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but let me just be very clear on what, what we mean by the reversal problem. Uh, Eduardo Laberia, a former student of mine at the World Bank, and I have written about this. I, you know, there's there's a link to a blog that that also goes through this, uh, the essence of this, this presentation today. Um, but you know, there, there's this often cited oh the pandemic you know the 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 the, the pandemic meant uh, uh, of course you know the pandemic has 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 been uh, a once in a century shock uh an incredibly synchronous shock but let the point i would like to leave with you is that the problems in many developing countries started well before covid um they had a very good, solid decade of growth and, and various markers of prosperity between the early 2000s when the last debt crisis was cleaned up, up until around 2015. 2015, commodity prices crashed. China growth, China had been a big engine of growth, slowed. Uh, and since 2015, many cracks began to manifest themselves. And of course, then comes COVID. And not only does COVID aggravate the situation, COVID is followed by the Russia-Ukraine war, which I have just heard, of course, you, you, those of you that have followed these series, um, has led to a widespread uh, problem of, of spiking food prices and in many cases food insecurity as well. So it, it it's, you know, when my son was young, I used to read to him a, a series of book called uh, a, a series of unfortunate events. And, and that's basically what we've had since 2015. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is just a very quick profile because Per capita GDP correlates enormously uh, with many of the social and economic markers that we care about to, to assess development. And what this trajectory shows uh, is the long multi-decade decline uh, in per capita GDP 
from the onset of the debt crisis of the 1980s, if anyone recalls, I was working in Wall Street at the time. The debt crisis of the 1980s was importantly not caused entirely, but importantly triggered by the significant tightening in monetary policy in the US. Uh, at the time in October 79, Paul Volcker basically uh, 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 took charge uh, of the inflation problem and hiked rates uh, rapidly and, and in the most uh, significant manner seen in, during World War, since World War II for developing countries, middle income, low income alike that had a lot of dollar debt, uh, a lot of variable rate debt, a lot of short-term debt, the spike in international interest rates was a major trigger point and I hope this does sound familiar to you, uh, given where we are in the current juncture, notwithstanding the fact that the orders of magnitude of the tightening that we are seeing uh, unfolding today are not at par with what we saw in the in the early, uh, the late, uh, the very tail end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. But what this trajectory highlights is that once the decade once the debt crisis hits, its effects are protracted. This is a point that Ken Rogoff and I make uh, in our book. Uh, it's, debt crises take a long time to resolve. International mechanisms for resolving debt crises are, are deeply flawed uh, to non-existent. And um, it, it, for the middle-income countries, it took about a decade to resolve. This was the Brady Plan. For the low-income countries, the HIPIC initiative, the Highly Indebted Poorest Country Initiative, uh, didn't really come around till 1996, didn't really take hold till around 2000. So you're really talking about two decades uh, of debt crisis, hence the long slide. Then, as I said, came a, a, a period of, of, of prosperity and recovery. You see the, the big surge uh, in real per capita income, but notice that much of the search was really just to get back to where they were in 1980. Uh, and then uh, since uh, 2015, we've been we've been definitely uh, in more more perilous territory with that surge and growth stagnating. Ne next slide, please. Uh, and a feature that I would like to highlight, I'm not going to go into the details. These slides are available for those that are interested. But the point of this table is to highlight that while the pandemic was clearly a synchronous across the board shock, 90% of countries had per capita income declines in 2020. Uh, this is a higher share of countries than in, in World War I, uh, in the Great Depression of the 30s, and in World War II. So it was the most synchronous shock that we've seen since at least 1900. Uh, but an important element of the recovery has been its inequality. Um, it's, it's, a, it's been a very regressive uh, shock, and the recovery has also been very regressive. If you look at the share of advanced economies, that have recouped their uh, prior peak in, in per capita income, that share is, is around 37%. If you go to middle income country, that share falls to 27%. And if you go to low income countries, it's below 20%. So the, the, the extent of the recovery uh, uh, has widened the gap between uh, low-income countries and high-income countries, although no one is admittedly at the moment doing all that well. Uh, uh, no one is, is an overstatement, but the majority of countries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so this just reiterates the World Bank uh, uh, has for years published the Global Genie, uh, and that measures uh, inequality across countries. And this just highlights the point that I've been making. Unlike the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, which hit Ireland very hard along with 
uh, uh, many advanced economies. The global financial crisis of 2008-2009 was called global, but it was really a, a crisis in advanced economies, mostly, uh, connected to property bubbles, banking problems, and over leverage of households and the financial sector, in a nutshell. Uh, and, and, but after the global financial crisis, what we saw is very rapid growth in developing countries and middle income countries and much more stagnant and, and um, uh, uneven recovery in the advanced economies. Uh, this is not what we're seeing post COVID. Post COVID, the most faltering recoveries have been uh, it, among the, the, the developing and particularly the low income countries. Next slide, please. Um, and this inequality problem uh, across countries is mirrored within countries. Uh, for the countries for which the World Bank has collected data on within country uh, uh, income distribution, uh, income distribution, uh, particularly uh, in middle low income countries has worsened uh, uh with 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 the COVID. this is with the covid shock it it doesn't really predate covid next slide please um and so poverty reduction uh which had stalled already prior to the pandemic has now reversed um and and in effect 2020 marked the first increase in poverty since uh, 1998. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to mention briefly that the, the uh, increase in poverty is also matched by an increase in learning poverty. And this has, this casts, the, the last point I'm making between turning to the debt issues is this, this casts a very long shadow on growth because it's impacted human capital and the hit has been particularly hard in middle income countries. So when we talk about debt problems, so far we've been mostly focused on low income countries, but the, the impacts of, of uh, uh, on, on the disruption to education, uh, which means down the line impacts on productivity and on growth uh, will be hitting also uh, middle income countries particularly hard. Next slide, please. So surprise, surprise, given the what I have outlined, you know, a, 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 I've, I've a fairly grim profile in which uh, per capita income uh, has has either stalled or outright declined. Um, and most social indicators have, have shown setbacks, which has required greater government assistance and intervention, surprise, surprise, uh, debt levels. Um, and I particularly look at here at debt to revenue. Uh, debt, debt to revenue levels follow this U shape. This is what we call the reversal problem from bad, uh, to better, back to bad. And, and the, the issue of debt concerns, it's not, you know, uh, being alarmist by any metric. Um, it, among the 73 countries that, are, that were eligible for the debt service suspension initiative uh, during 2020 and 2021 in the, in the height of the pandemic, uh, for those 74 countries, more than 60% of them are at either debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. This is based on the uh, joint IMF World Bank debt sustainability exercises, which bucket countries uh, into uh, groups, low, low probability of distress, moderate probability of distress, high probability of distress, and in distress. And that those, those two buckets, uh, the high risk buckets, um, the share of countries there, and we will talk more about that, have increased dramatically. Next slide, please. 
what is very telling about this chart, just, and again, I'm rushing through so we have time for discussion. This is debt servicing. This is total external debt service. What is very telling is we've been living in a world, at least in the advanced economies, and, and notably, very notably, Japan and Europe, in a negative uh, nominal interest rate environment, and, and, and it, but exceptionally low interest rates uh, by any historic metric, and low for long. And even in that low rate environment, I would note, debt servicing costs had been rising already, even before the rate hikes uh, that, and, and the, even before the, the recent post high inflation turning points that we have seen at the Fed, at the ECB. Uh, um, and, and this importantly owes to the fact that risk measures a uh, credit risk had been already deteriorating, as I said, even before COVID. I would add that the debt servicing costs are poised to rise quite markedly uh, because um, we've had, while we've seen a better distribution of external debt than in the early 1980s, less reliance on short-term debt, which of course, is very prone to rollover risk. Um, uh, we still have what are near record share of variable rate debt, external debt, so that the recent rate hikes uh, translate to debt servicing fairly quickly. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, I, at, the, at the risk of, of sounding just outright alarmist, it's important to note that economic setbacks historically have also often gone hand in hand uh, with uh, setbacks in, in, to political order and, and, and political stability and, and have been big, big, uh, uh, have, have been a big factor uh, giving rise to social unrest. This is um, an index from Freedom House in which they look at uh, democratic values. They have a whole range description. I, I highlight their webpage there. Um, and, and the metrics of what is happening on this front are also uh, uh, you know, of that U-shaped variety from bad to better uh, to, to, to worse. So the definitely the economic slide has is also having a uh, political and geopolitical uh, dimension. Next slide, please. Um, contrary, and this I mentioned earlier, so I'm repeating myself, but I, I will be as, as quick as possible. Uh, at the end of the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, the big takeaway was that credit risk for the advanced economies, uh, certainly this hit Ireland, uh, it, it, it hit Portugal, uh, it hit Spain, of course, Greece was in a league of its own, it hit Italy, and it may hit it again. Um, and, and the, the outturn of the global financial crisis was a worsening in the credit ratings of the advanced economies, but an improvement in the credit ratings of the emerging and developing countries. This is being reversed now. And so, look, I'm not going to tell you that we are on the verge of the same drama the debt with drama that we saw in uh, the beginning of the 1980s, in which when Mexico defaulted, Mexico being a very important emerging market, a large emerging market, it had a lot of contagion effects, uh, and you quickly saw domino effects, um, and and and. It, it doesn't have that drama on the emerging front. It doesn't have the drama yet uh, of what we saw after the global financial crisis in which it started as a banking crisis and then um, concerns about sovereign debt crises 
uh, came to the head a, a couple of years later as, 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 as Greece defaulted. Um, I'm not saying this is, you know, we're, we're on that scale because a lot of the most affected countries are not systemic countries. They're very poor. They, they don't have a big footprint in financial markets, but the risks are rising that the uh, spread of, of debt problems uh, could go well beyond uh, the low income dimension that I've, I've been focusing on. Next slide, please. Um, capital flows. Uh, which are a, a big, you know, for not foreign direct investment, but capital flows in general have been a big propeller of growth uh, for, for de developing countries historically. Um, and on the West, uh, this is the global picture. On the West, the situation is complicated by uh, you know, notwithstanding better news uh, in on the U.S. side on the inflation front, uh, you know we are we are at a much tighter, fin fin much tighter financial conditions uh, currently than we had been uh, in years, and that has slowed, importantly, dramatically, capital flows to not only the low-income countries, which many are at a standstill in terms of capital flows, but also to middle income uh, emerging markets. Moreover, and this is a big moreover, on the right-hand panel, what you see is lending, net lending from China. China and, and uh, uh, Sebastian Horn, Christoph Trevish, and I have been writing about this for years. And uh, China was a big lender to many, especially commodity producers, many uh, of them low income, but not exclusively. Uh, and that lending uh, continued to dramatically increase. Uh, by 2017, however, there were signs that A, the countries that had borrowed were doing poorly and were having debt servicing difficulties. So debt restructurings with China have increased uh, significantly also. And B, China was having its own uh, slowdown and its own domestic problems. So lending abroad uh, has, has been impacted. So bottom line, this is a double whammy in terms of, of the reversal of capital flows. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and I'm almost done. Um, Adding to the COVID woes of slow recovery and, and, and the setbacks that I've noted, uh, the, the rise in food prices. Uh, so this hasn't been, it, food is a very, rising food prices is also extremely regressive because it is low income households that have spent the largest share of their consumption basket in food, and it is the low-income countries that have the largest share of, of their CPI, of their consumption basket, also in food. So the, the, the security, food security situation, which had worsened even before the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, has, has, has contributed to, to this reversal problem. Next slide. Um, and this is just, you know, further, further detail on which highlights that to, the big takeaway from this slide is not just a, a low income problem. It's also a middle income problem uh, with food prices, uh, again, uh, contributing to uh, across country and within country uh, inequality. Next slide. To sum up. Um, you know what, what lies ahead. I think it's it's there are major risks. Um, the 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 a debt crisis for low income countries is not a hypothetical. The majority are already either there or at high risk of a debt crisis, as I noted earlier. Um, I think a big concern is what if a big emerging market. Uh, this is something that we, we had a discussion on, on global tail risks at the IMF last week, 
And this was, of course, one of the, the big tail risks. What if some a country like Turkey, like Brazil, uh, like South Africa, a country that has a bigger footprint in, in capital markets, uh, you know, could, could have a, a debt crisis and trigger contagion, we are at a much more vulnerable point um, uh, on that score. Uh, and, and um, you know, uh, again, um, I would like to leave you, and this is a good point for discussion, with the fact that at the end of the, the debt service suspension initiative towards the tail end of 2021, the G20 came up with a so-called common framework uh, for debt treatments, which is supposed to deal with debt overhangs and unsustainable debt cases. So far, uh, and it's, it's you know, uh, uh, been a trial balloon, we haven't had a single debt restructuring to date under the common framework. Progress has been non-existent on that score practically. Well, not practically, it's been non-existent. Uh, and we don't seem to have uh, a, a, a catalyst for, for promoting debt reduction um, and you know, debt write-offs, debt you know, haircuts that are needed. Um, so the last note of concern is I am worried that this is beginning to look like a replay of the very slow moving 1980s in which it took um, uh, about a decade to resolve the crisis of the middle income countries. And it took about two decades uh, to eventually resolve the debt crisis of the low income countries. We do not have a very good financial architecture uh, to deal with the uh, growing debt problems that we've been discussing today. And I'll stop here. Thank you very, very much for a terrific sort of tour d'horizon of, uh, of, of the, 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 the challenges, the, the threats, the risks that we're facing into. Um, there are many quite troubling points you bring up um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of detail that we, can, we, we, that, that we would love to get into. Um, let me begin with uh, a, a, question, a question really about the re restructuring. Um, you, as you've rightly pointed out, there hasn't been a single debt uh, restructuring so far under the, the, the common framework. But do you think that political pressure will begin to build uh, towards restructurings uh, at, at, at some level? Uh, bear in mind the number of countries, the low in income countries, which are now in, let's say, serious debt distress. I mean, you, you make the point that they are, they are all in a debt crisis to some extent, but uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, that we're going to be facing into deteriorating circumstances and it's hard to see debt structuring being uh, left to one side. It's going to come more and more center, uh, center stage, but what are the political, what are the realistic chances of achieving debt restructuring agreements uh, in the near future? I, I think that the, the prospects are pretty grim. We have a very complicated geopolitical situation, you know, the tensions between China uh, and the West and China and the US uh, in particular um, are a, a huge factor. I bring this up because I, I noted this in my presentation, but a big, a, a big factor is that for a, a lot of the low income countries, uh, China is the big creditor. In effect, China is a bigger creditor than the entire Paris Club official creditors combined. Mm. And, and so um, China has to play ball with uh, the uh, other, uh, you know, the other official creditors. This is a strange situation because China has been accustomed to doing its own thing when it comes to debt restructuring. Uh, the typical, typical Chinese debt restructuring approach 
which is reminiscent of what we used to do in the early 1980s, by the way. This is not unique to China or, or China bashing in any way. It's uh, you don't, creditors don't like to take losses. That's that's the reality. That's an eternal reality. Creditors don't like to take losses. So the typical approach uh, China has had thus far is is uh, you you may do some maturity extension, but, but but really there's no haircuts. There's no reduction in you know improvement in the terms of lending. What often is is what is often offered is is some cash flow relief, meaning you have some grace periods, but this doesn't solve a debt. Grace periods do not solve uh, a debt overhang. What you need are haircuts. And I think um, uh, China is not there yet any more than US banks were willing to take on significant haircuts at the early stages of the 1980s debt crisis. As I said, you know, look at the, 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 the G20 has had problems even issuing uh, uh, communiques. Uh, so so, so it, it, it is a complicated geopolitical situation. And, and you know, you, to, to get all the creditors to line up and notably for non-Paris club, because it's not just China, but China is by far the largest, but also Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, uh, and to a lesser degree, India are also uh, other non-Paris club creditors. And, and getting, getting a, a coalition on what to do uh, is, I think, very, very far off. So I am not optimistic that we're going to uh, see a turning point. I would close by saying though, I don't think to be very fair that the Paris Club uh, members are also rushing in to say, oh, we got to do haircuts. And often the response that I've heard from board members uh, representing uh, Paris Club uh, countries at the bank uh, is, well, we've done this before and here we are again, why should we do haircuts uh, again? So so uh, the answer to your question is a very pessimistic uh, yeah. uh, outlook. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, a couple of questions uh, here on the uh, interaction between climate and uh, uh, and 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 debt distress. So, um, first a question from Dara Lawler, who's a researcher with the institute. And Dara asks, um, if one is looking at the sovereign debt profiles of countries in the global south, how big an issue is risk from from climate? Uh, for example, the destruction of capital by by natural disaster or from natural disasters. So, I mean, what what? What uh, impact does climate have on um, uh, debt profiles in the global south? Uh, and if I may add just a second question, Carmen, which is, uh, what would your views be on the Bridgetown initiative being championed by Prime Minister Matthias of Barbados, which uh, envisages cutting off debt repayment when climate disaster strikes? That's a question from Eileen Scollin of the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Could I try you on those two? Uh, those are the climate question is enormous, enormous. Uh, the the World Bank is 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 of course you know uh, been been increasingly uh, involved in in trying to tackle the, the the whole range of issues. Let me begin in reverse and and talk about the uh, changing debt contracts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, since that's because the other the other question is also has other other many other dimensions that I want to highlight. Um, look, uh, uh, state contingent contracts, uh, especially when you're dealing. I mean, I think uh, investors again are you know always been they. they if you can get a guaranteed return or, or walk closer to a guaranteed return, uh, that will be the preference. But state contingent contracts make a great deal of sense, especially uh, for countries uh, like Barbados uh, and that that you know face uh, the 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 you know probability of inc increasing frequency 
of, of, of climate shocks. Um, so, you know, the, the debt service suspension initiative uh, was really, uh, if you call it, you can call it a, a trial balloon. It was, you know, debt servicing was suspended for, for almost two years, almost, uh, during a, a period of, 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 of extreme duress during the pandemic. Um, and so having that built into a contract to me makes a great deal of sense. The problem is of course, uh, uh, state contingent contracts have always had a, a hard sell in markets. So the cost of borrowing and the ability to raise fund if you start building in such clauses is, is gonna be tough. Although they make imminent sense from certainly from the vantage point of, of, of the borrower. Uh, now turning to the big question of climate risk, which is huge. It's a, it's a huge, um, the uh, World Development Report, which was started well, and the, 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 the next one, the, the first, the, the, First one that I did was on financial fragility. The second one is looking at migration patterns globally. And you, 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 your question is, is right on point. Uh, a great deal of the migration patterns uh, as we look ahead are going to be shaped by climate risk. Um, and climate risk, um, not just of the Barbados variety where you're more likely to, to, to be hit, but, but, but you know, the uh, growing size of the desert, the uh, various dimensions of, of, of climate change. Again, talk about regressive. The, much of the adverse changes are concentrated, are very regressive, are concentrated in low income countries. Uh, so climate needs, um, climate financing, climate financing needs are another layer. Uh, it, it, financing needs for these countries, as I highlighted in my presentation, are already uh, uh, high. Mm -hmm. um, they're high because they have large deficits still, a legacy of the economic slowdown. They're large because debt servicing burdens, as I showed, have been rising and, and the levels of debt have, have risen dramatically. So, and, and add to that new needs to finance uh, adaptation and mitigation. Um, this is a very tough, uh, and, and remember, I also mentioned that if you take a big picture of global capital flows, you know, the north-south capital flows, uh, on the west, those capital flows are being slowed by, by you know, the interest rate hike, sh sh more, more moving to, to risk off rather than the full risk on we had for so many years. Uh, on the East, you have less Chinese lending. So already sort of in basic needs, capital flows, things are slowing. When you layer climate needs on top of that, um, that it, it, it's, it's going to be a very difficult uh, uh, it, it, very difficult to reach um, any kind of meaningful climate goals with such a, a Spartan uh, amount of funding. Because again, let, let, let me get to, to, to the bottom line. When you talk about in, to, to many investors, uh, private investors, oh, we want green bonds, we love green bonds, we want to be green, we want to, you know, very green hoe. However, the first thing that they want is guarantees on many projects. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, if you're closing a mine, if you're closing a, a coal plant uh, and closing, a, that, that, that's a, that, that project doesn't have a positive rate of return. I mean, it has its social rate of return, but it, it and, and if institutions like the World Bank start guaranteeing, um, 
the the these these uh, projects um, as investors would love, they're basically unraveling their own uh, um, uh, you know the, 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 their own mode of operations. I mean, uh, the World Bank and the multilaterals mostly IMF is different, but uh, they they work by issuing uh, uh, AAA debt so that they can use the low cost funding to, to provide concessional finance. Uh, but if you start uh, denting that AAA status by guaranteeing a lot of uh, uh, debt, that very high risk debt, debt projects, um, uh, high risk projects, um, you start undermining your very model. And in the end, the guarantees are going to be given by the G20, by the big governments, uh, and and so there's this impasse again between yes, we want to be green, but we want big returns also, uh, and 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 who's going to pay for that? Indeed, yeah. Thank you very much, Carmen. Um, the enormous debt burden which uh, many low-income countries are carrying and which has been exacerbated by the shocks we're talking about, in particular the pandemic, um, are obviously detrimental to achieving the sustainable development goals and the, the, the 2030 agenda. Uh, there is, as you know, a, a summit which is due next September uh, at which the, the world will take stock in, in, in strategic terms of how we're doing on the SDGs and what has, ye has yet to be done in order to accelerate progress. What would you like to see uh, being championed in the area of, 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 of debt uh, relief and uh, debt restructuring at that summit? I mean, the summit will be an opportunity for world leaders to recognize that the um, that there is a huge contribution to be made to achieving the SDGs by making it easier for low-income countries to uh, to to manage their debt. Is there a particular initiative that you would like to see um, that summit take? Well, I, I think I, I I what I'm going to say here is sort of a minimum minimorum um, that okay. So at a minimum. Why don't we catalyze, give give some signs of of success to the common framework? Uh, why don't we start at least at a minimum minimorum, even if the common framework, which has uh, you know uh, a lot of areas that that could use significant improvement in terms of improving the you know, mechanics across creditors and all kinds of details that I don't have time to, to, to elaborate on here, but even, even taking it at face value, why don't we at least show progress uh, and make it a point to, to increase the, uh, because there's a complaint, why don't more countries apply to the common framework? Well, why would you apply to the common framework if you're going to be labeled as having a debt problem and you have had seen no evidence that applying to the common framework got anybody anywhere? Uh, so so progress uh, by, by progress, meaning real debt restructurings uh, in the context of the common framework are, are at least a starting point. Yeah. Um, Carmen, a question from uh, Dan O'Brien, um, who asks, how well prepared is the global financial system for haircuts on significant emerging market economies of the kind that you referred to a moment ago, such as Brazil, Turkey, and so on? Is, is the world financial architecture ready for um, haircuts in relation to those countries? Uh, so... Look, uh, I, let, this is a critical question, and and um, it I'm going to answer it in two stages. Uh, first is um, the uh, the first part. The common framework uh, should be very much part and parcel 
uh, working also with private predators. Um, so private, you know, it, 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 uh, a common treatment across official creditors is necessary but not sufficient. It's common treatment also across private creditors. Now, this doesn't, going to the heart of, I think, Dan's question, the, 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 these numbers don't really challenge the, the, the solvency or create a big hole for the private creditors. Like, for example, in the early 1980s, you had a handful of US banks that had massive exposures, especially to Latin America, but not exclusively. And it really created, you know, the a, a, a severe vulnerability shock as long as it's the the the, the uh, low income sphere it it doesn't i don't think you know i think the, the that could be absorbed you know even common treatment could be absorbed however i don't see that happening imminently either that 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 um, that we are going to uh, necessarily make progress on that score. But, but I think that that shock could be absorbed. I think when we start getting really worried is if a, a Turkey, Turkey is, is, is it's, you know, it, it, it's got a lot of issues to, to, and, and, and it's had a lot of issues uh, for some time. Uh, but I mentioned Turkey because uh, uh, you know, Turkey is a country that also could significantly extend the turbulence to Europe. Uh, you know, Turkey does play a card on immigration policy. Um, Turkey uh, also is 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 a borrower from European banks, and and so the nature of the impact on on the financial system's ability to absorb the shock uh, starts really to change complexion, importantly. Um, let me say something of banks versus non-banks, and then, then I'll stop. Uh, look, unlike the 1980s, which I mentioned core money center US banks were, were overexposed and were vulnerable and probably hadn't not been for Paul Volcker also reducing interest rates dramatically, uh, many might have had even a worst outcome. Uh, commercial banks were, were, you know, core money center banks. You know, these were cleaned up importantly after the global financial crisis. However, there's a lot of non-bank, you know, the the uh, uh, shadow bank vulnerability is a different matter. And and I always worry, always that you never know where, how many of you remember, maybe not, I don't know, uh, but long-term capital management, LTCM. This is the, the heavy exposure to Russia uh, and others and the 1998 shock. And all of a sudden you have, you know, uh, uh, vulnerabilities and exposure that quickly ripple through capital markets. And that is hard to predict. So. Core banks, I don't think that's the problem. I think within shadow banking, uh, I think th there is a, a, a lot more pot potential for contagion, but it really depends on how big is the country, how connected. That's why I, I highlighted the Turkey connection, which is, I think, you know, uh, very germane, uh, but, but it, it that's a different level of risk. I think the low income side can be can be absorbed without without major major um, uh, problems. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, another question here: um, What what can be done to what steps can be taken to um, improve transparency of debt data? Uh, this has been. Thank you for that question. I devoted so much of my energy at the World Bank to doing, trying to achieve just that. Uh, I mentioned that a lot of the work that I've done with uh, Sebastian Horn and Christoph Trebisch over the last few years was concentrated on what we call China's hidden debts. Uh, Chinese contracts, debt contracts, since 2013 often uh, included non-disclosure clauses. 
meaning you don't a country, a country borrowing doesn't disclose those debts to the IMF, to the World Bank, uh, or to often even uh, their own within government. So if it was a, an, an SOE, uh, you know, a state-owned enterprise borrowing, uh, that state-owned enterprise uh, may not may have been uh, forbidden to to share that that that. Uh, uh, information on that transaction, even with other parts of their government. So uh, debt transparency uh, uh, is always been a problem, always been a problem, right? I mean, in back in the 1980s, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, opaque lending as well. Um, but opacity reached, I think, a global peak with the surge in, in China's overseas lending. Um, the World Bank, uh, I took, you know, under, under uh, my direction, the global debts, the, the world debt statistics are published under the, the, the direction of the chief economist. Uh, we work very hard to uh, start incorporating because it, 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 all these unknown hidden debts is what what's the meaning how meaningful is the debt sustainability exercise if the debt levels that you're working with are way off right i mean we remember the scandal or, or, or with greece and goldman sachs you know that the debt numbers had been fudged uh, and so on. Well, uh, it, it, this is an even greater order of magnitude that we're talking and about affecting a lot of countries. So um, the World Bank has taken uh, the most recent uh, world debt tables uh, had the biggest increase, the biggest spike, the biggest revision, upward revision in debt in its history from 1950. So we're, we're and the IMF and other multilaterals are also trying to to uh, really incorporate these hidden debts. However, um, you know, I I think um, there has been progress, but I think uh, uh, you know th there is still a lot of unknowns. Uh, a sir, uh, you know, I don't want to also overfocus just on China. Um, for example, there's a lot of lending from I mentioned other uh, non-Paris club members like Saudi Arabia and UAE, which often uh, that lending is often done by through deposits to the central bank and the like, which are often difficult to trace. Uh, and and uh you know the another form of new lending if you will newer lending uh from china is, is uh pboc people's republic uh, uh, bank of china uh um swap lines these are all difficult to 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 quantify uh so it's it's you the multilaterals have to be on their toes that they cannot take reported debt numbers uh, at face value. Um, and, you know, um, there were more, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that um, the G20 language on the common framework uh, and other debt documents, in, every time it included language on transparency, uh, it, it was an issue for China. And and often the 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 outcome was that the language would be redrafted. So uh, the geopolitical dimension definitely complicates the transparency question as well. Carmen, I think we might have time for just one final question. If you're good enough to to take it on the the common framework, um, three countries have so far asked for their debt to be treated through the the framework, but uh, and these are Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia, but none of them has been able to complete the process. How can the process be made more accessible for developing and low-income countries who mightn't have the structures, uh, uh, the, the domestic structures, uh, in place to complete the process? Okay, so so this is a very important question, um, and it enables me to talk about domestic debt also, which is a big factor, big new element that I hadn't been able to talk about. Let's start with external debt. Okay, so 
Chad was the first to apply and Chad had looked for a while after a lot of a lot of back and forth that it could um you know we could have an agreement on a haircut uh that involved uh the the Paris Club creditors it involved China and it importantly also involved Glencore the large single largest uh, uh creditor uh, to Chad and then lo and behold oil prices rose and all of a sudden you know Chad which is deeply impoverished uh I mean it's always been deeply impoverished but the situation is is deteriorated markedly over the last uh five to ten years uh and 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 all of a sudden it was deemed that well at current oil prices that is sustainable so chad is a big success story not because it restructured its debt but because supposedly it doesn't have a debt problem which is of course uh largely a work of fiction uh chad has restructured its debt uh um on 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 two occasions since 2015 and it was it, it will need a third and it was so i i'm i'm highlighting the chad situation because it looked for a moment as the closest thing to a success uh before it fell apart uh now what i mentioned this earlier what what country has an incentive to apply for uh, treatment. When you look around in the three countries, uh, let's leave Ethiopia aside because it also has, you know, a lot of, you know, it, 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 political and, and, and unrest issues that are difficult. But uh, the, the, the ones that have applied have gotten nowhere. Um, so, but I, I, this, the, the, the question also raised the issue of domestic debt. Let me say something quickly. One big new factor, relatively newer factor, in the current debt landscape of low-income countries, and certainly even more so middle-income countries, is that a lot of the debt is domestic, meaning it is issued under domestic law, as opposed to international law. Um, and and I think um, there. Um, the multilaterals are working and perhaps should work even more aggressively on uh, uh, fostering best practices on restructuring of domestic debt. Uh, because a lot, practically all the focus of debt renegotiations historically have been on external debt, i.e. debt issued under New York law or London law, or, you know, not, not issued under local law. Uh, and, and so I think uh, development of best practices uh, will help because at least that is an area where countries have more control because they don't have to rely on, on the external machinery uh for for debt restructuring they they can rely on their own courts uh, but of course we know that domestic debt restructuring can be rapacious i mean argentina is is, is of course a classic uh example of that but let me stop there thank you very much carmen uh, i mean it, it's a fascinating topic and uh i, I we would all love to have a bit more time to be able to pursue it further. But you've been very generous with your own time and uh, the presentation was wonderful. Thank you very much. You've also kindly offered to make the PowerPoint available for those who, are, who have a particular interest. Um, you also have contributed uh, in a very engaging way to the, the Q&A and we thank you for that. So once again, thank you for making yourself available for today's event, Common. Um, the Institute has greatly benefited from it. Um, and uh, we wish you all, all, all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great pleasure, Carmen. Thank you very much. And before we end this uh, uh, session, I would like to, uh, on behalf of the Institute, thank uh, Irish Aid warmly for the uh, generous support with which they have helped us to uh, mount this series of, 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 of lectures of which Professor Carmen Reinhardt's uh, lecture today is the eighth and final uh, 
um, uh, in, uh, episode. This year's uh, Development Matters series now comes to an end. Next year's will have uh, implementation of the SDGs as a central focus, bearing in mind that the uh, that, that a, a special SDG summit is to be held uh, at the UN next September, more or less at the halfway point in terms of um, implementation. So once again, thank you to our audience. Thank you to Professor Reinhardt in particular for today's event. And thank you to Irish Aid for having made it all possible.